I think actually we're live now, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Grabowski. I am the chair of the communication department here at Manhattan College. I'm really pleased to have everyone here tonight. I'm told that we have over 120 people just in this room alone. We have another 250 people watching live on our Manhattan College YouTube channel, and we have even more folks across the Bronx watching live on BronxNet on Optimum Cable and Verizon Fio. So I'd like to welcome everyone at home as well. This is a first in a series of conversations that we're going to have at this college about the impact of artificial intelligence. Um, we have some very distinguished panelists, uh, a few alumni here as well, and later we're gonna be hearing from a bo our board of advisors. And we'd like to also hear from you and your questions. Uh, the uh, people that I have sitting up here with me tonight, I'm really excited to have everyone. Um, just to the right of me, uh, to your left, is Eileen Murray. Uh, graduated in 1980 from Manhattan College, has an honorary doctorate of science in, from 2015. Uh, is the former CEO and, and former chair of the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority and is a principal uh, at Bridgewater Associates. I believe it's the largest hedge firm in the country, is that right? Oh, fat. <laughs> I need you back. Uh, so welcome, uh, very happy to have you. Um, and then just down the row here, we have Robert Otani, uh, who is lead AP. Uh, is the principal, senior principal, and chief technology officer of Thornton Tomasetti. Now, if you don't know what Tor Thornton Tomasetti is, it's, it's a world-leading uh, design, structural engineering firm, uh, construction firm, and they're responsible for some of the world's uh, most famous skyscrapers, just about every stadium that I've ever seen a game in, including the New Yankee Stadium and MetLife Stadium. Uh, and so really responsible for building the iconic structures that, that we're familiar with. And then at the end of the table, we have Noreen Kral, graduated in 1987 from Manhattan College um, and is the retired chief litigation counsel and vice president of Apple. Uh, so if you, really, if you want to talk to people who know what's going on with AI, if this uh, panel right here are, are the experts. So I'm really happy to welcome them uh, here tonight and, and join all of us here on campus at Manhattan College. Uh, before we begin uh, asking questions and talking about AI, I thought given that it's a, a buzzword that's been flying around and people uh, might have different ideas of what AI is. I thought I'd spend a little bit of time on background on what we're talking about, what we mean by artificial intelligence or AI. And it has nothing to do with human, I won't say nothing, but uh, it's different than human intelligence. Uh, it's not a conscious entity. Uh, but I just thought we'd run through really quickly and sort of overview uh, what AI is. And it's really the next step or next evolutionary uh, moment in computing. You know, um, any new technology starts off uh, being perceived like it's magic, like it's this crazy thing. And then if everyone's tried out chat, GP, uh, chat GPT, I'll see if I can say that three times fast, uh, you'll know what I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, then we quickly go into a, a utopian phase where this new thing is going to make our lives better. I've always heard that um, every new technology is going to improve education. We'll be able to, to uh, scale it around the world. And then that's quickly followed by uh, a dystopian phase in technology. Uh, oh, this is going to destroy our lives or it's going to make lives harder for us. Uh, the one thing uh, that I've got to say about this discussion about AI, among the people who have been talking about it, is I'm really pleased at how quickly the conversation has become nuanced, that people are recognizing both the benefits but also the challenges, the concerns, and sort of the ethical guardrails we have to put up when employing this technology. So, you know, it's not Skynet, it's not the Matrix, uh, but uh, it can be a pretty powerful tool, and it can be used for both, both uh, good and bad. So we'll, we'll talk about that this evening. So as that 
next stage of computing. You know, computers, when they were first invented, were really calculating machines. Now, you all have in your uh, pockets a device that's uh, an order of magnitude more powerful than this room size ENIAC computer. Uh, all this computer did was calculate. We quickly moved, though, to com using computers as a form of data storage and retrieval so that we were able to store huge sums of data. And so both in these first two stages, we have a very centralized industry. You need a lot of capital to build these things. Uh, you need, in the case of data storage, you need a mainframe computer to store all that data. But you're able to do things on a larger scale than humans were able to do previously. Uh, the next stage of computing was really computing as a form of communication. Uh, when I was your age, this is how I got online. Uh, but uh, now we're always online. This is CompuServe from Columbus, Ohio, where I was an undergraduate. And uh, we started networking these computers together. We started having the machines talk to one another, and that allowed us to be able to talk to other people. As long as you had a, an internet connection, started with ARPANET and then expanded into the internet, um, you were able to use these devices to really talk to anyone around the world. Not only were people talking to people, but people were talking to machines, machines were talking to people, and machines were talking to other machines. So when we're talking about artificial intelligence, we're, we're referring to a series, uh, a way of computing that's different than the way computer programs have been written previously. Uh, usually when you write a program, when you're coding something, you're having a computer do a specific task, and it can only do that task the way you code it. Uh, but different forms of AI use what we call machine learning, or taking a data set and being able to extrapolate from that data set to either um, identify patterns, uh, possibly even make predictions, or generate things uh, out, out of whole cloth. And so, we can have a, at the most basic level, a statistical model using linear regression to identify patterns in data that we feed a model and then have it um, guess those patterns or identify patterns in other sets of data. Uh, we can use contextual uh, programming so that uh, it identifies data based on the data around it. So when you think about natural language programs, it's really important to not only know the word that you're feeding it, but also the words around it, because words obviously change their meaning depending on the context in which you're using that word. Uh, we can move on to generative forms, transformative forms, and neural networks are really about uh, modeling algorithms after how our own uh, nervous system works, that uh, each neuron in our brain has about, on average, 10,000 different connections. So you're talking to 10,000 other neurons, and you have on the order of 80 billion neurons in your brain. So we're nowhere near that in terms of artificial intelligence, but it's using some of those same principles. So. We talk about AI in general, but we can refer to very specific uh, types of applications. And so when we talk about AI, we can refer to like a strict AI or an AI designed to do a particular function, or we can talk about the hypothetical general AI, where artificial intelligence could possibly take on any task that it's given based on what it's learned uh, so far. And so we're already familiar in the news with these new models that have popped out. Uh, including ChatGPT. This is uh, a, uh, a, a algorithm that has been released by the OpenAI Institute. Uh, recently, um, back in November, ChatGPT uh, 3.5. By the way, GP3 stands, um, uh, stands for, I had it right here, I should know this. I should know this. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that later. But um, ChatGPT is, um, um, uses uh, natural language simulation. So you can ask it a question and it responds or generates um, uh, language in uh, a, a way similar that we might, might have a conversation uh, with an, another person. And so, oh yeah, here we go. I, I was going too fast here. So GPT is a generative pre-trained transformer algorithm. 
And what that means is that's using the transformer algorithm or giving a specific weight to each piece of data to determine how significant it is. And it's pre-trained, which means that it's not doing this on its own. It's starting to generate these patterns and then humans are rating or guiding it into what are uh, more or less correct patterns and what are incorrect patterns and it learns and gets better from that. And that's what we mean by uh, G GPT. Um, Microsoft, when um, uh, ChatGPT was released, started uh, integrating it into its Bing, its Bing search engine. And so it turns out that ChatGPT version 4, which was just released last week, has been used in Bing up until now. This is going to become a part of all of our lives if we use computers because Microsoft is integrating these functions into its Microsoft Office products. And so it's calling this Copilot, Microsoft Copilot. And uh, if you use Microsoft Word or Excel or PowerPoint, these AI tools will become a part of those programs. Google's been sitting on its AI al algorithm for quite some time now, but its hand was sort of forced and on this past Tuesday released its version that it calls BARD. Uh, DALI is a uh, version of an image, image generation, so that's another uh, type of AI where you can use, uh, give it a text prompt and it can produce an image based on what you're describing. There's another program that many people have already been using called Mid Journey. We'll take a look at some examples of that. Uh, but really interestingly and possibly a little frightening is that there is the ability to have AI for hire. There are companies that will allow you to use their algorithms. You feed it the data set that you want it to train on and it can produce a uh, essentially an AI machine uh, to be able to do the task that you're asking it to do based on the data that you've trained it on. So AI is already being used in legal uh, profession, in, in the medical um, research, in finance, uh, even in, in filmmaking. And um, it, it's, it's really becoming an integral part of what we do when we do something that we thought previously was just human uh, endeavors. So I went ahead and I asked Ch ChatGPT uh, if it could define AI for us. And this is the response that it gave me. Uh, it's a little general, but it's pretty accurate. And uh, just to talk a little bit about how this system is learning, uh, the version 3.5, I asked it, and you might have seen this online of people doing this, I've asked ChatGPT 3.5 to write a Wikipedia article about me. And it had all these factual inaccuracies. Well, I went into version four and asked the exact same question and all those inaccuracies had been removed and it left little prompts for me to fill in the specific personal information that it did not know about me. So it's already learning not to give erroneous information but to allow the human using it to provide information it doesn't have. Um, when I simply asked the question, who are you? This is what it told me. I'm guessing I'm not the first person to ask this. Uh, I'm Chad GPT, an AI language model created by OpenAI. Um, please feel free to ask me anything. I'll do my best uh, to help you. Although if you ask it certain questions that its trainers have told it not to answer, it will politely demur and say, I'm sorry, but I'm not allowed to talk about that. So I mentioned before that uh, this uh, type of technology is being used in, in the industry that I teach, which is uh, film and television production. And this is a company uh, called um, Flawless, and it has a product called uh, True Sync. And it's, it's up and running now, and the concept of this company is that if you have a movie and you want to change the rating of the movie by replacing uh, words that an actor has said, um, this program will learn through facial recognition the structure of the uh, visual element, generate a new one, learn the patterns of the actor's voice, and generate new dialogue. So I'm going to uh, play this out. Another application for this is dubbing in other languages. So this was pretty remarkable when I watched this. On this stupid tower in the middle of nowhere. And I don't blame you, and now we're stuck on this stupid stuck on this stupid freaking tower in the middle of freaking nowhere. 
And it's all my fault. Gabe, it's a stereo, Nesh. Yosh. Yes, so the for me culpa. So that's what AI can do right now. This isn't science fiction. This is this is um, happening right now. Now, um, just to wrap this up, some of the you know concerns about this is if you can do this with any um, sample of an actor's voice, uh, what else can you do? And one of the concerns about AI is that you can generate images and present them as factual when um, it's not the case. And so. Um, this, um, this um, artist, Elliot Higgins, uh, generated a series of images this week uh, using the DALI image generation program, uh, imagining what it's going to look like if Donald Trump were to be arrested. And so this is what the AI algorithm spit out. Uh, just to be absolutely clear, these images are not real. They did not happen. But you can imagine what might happen if someone started distributing these images as if they did happen. So just to wrap up this, this conversation, I've been reading uh, critics of technology. And, and something that spoke to me when I was thinking about AI was this quote. Um, you give your disciples not truth, but only the semblance of truth. They will be hearers of many things, and they will have learned nothing. They will appear to be omniscient and will generally know nothing. There will be tiresome company having the show of wisdom without the reality. Now that actually uh, was Plato writing in the voice of Socrates complaining about the new technology of writing. Uh, so if you've uh, read the Phaedrus, you'll recognize that quote. So um, a lot of these questions that are coming up with AI may not be new questions at all, but uh, we can learn from past technologies. The real danger, however, I believe, is when we stop talking about AI, because then it becomes environmental. It becomes something that we don't critically reflect on, you know, something that would exist just in the background, um, something that just is. And so it's my hope that we continue these conversations, and this is the first in a series of conversations we will be having about AI. So at this point, I want to turn it over to our panelists and ask our first question, which is, if you could describe in your industry uh, what, where you're seeing AI being applied, and if you can give us a sense of where you think this is going. Thank you. I just want to tell you that Donald Trump thing you had was on Facebook. Anyways, uh, thank you, and thank you for having me uh, here today. I, I, I've been in financial services for about, uh, God, going on five decades. I started when I was 12 years old, so anyways, uh, that's another story. Uh, but in terms of AI and financial services, uh, I think it's, it's just the beginning, and different firms are using it in different ways. Basically, if you look at, you can't hear me? Sorry. Um, collecting data and processes, you would imagine that in financial services, certain types of accounting work, certain types of paralegal work. Uh, these, these huge companies have their own legal departments, so you would, you would imagine there. You would imagine in back office transaction processing that there's a lot of AI that's going on in there, which would reduce capital charges, reduce costs, reduce risk. Interestingly, it hasn't been done in the financial services firms I know in those areas where you would think that collect, collecting data and process automation using AI uh, would be as prevalent. It's more on the upper end. So, you know, financial credit decisions where hordes of data are pulled together to look at the credit quality of people. And it's actually helping to bring people in who were probably underserved in credit uh, situations before because there's much more data that can be looked at. Uh, managing financial risk in terms of looking if you're a CFO or you're a treasurer, pulling all sorts of data, even more data than you've pulled before. Uh, AI in terms of quantitative trading has been there for years in terms of trades that are done, proprietary trading, uh, where traders will take in lots and lots of huge data sets and their, their job is to uh, basically convert that into great trading decisions that are better than uh, other, other firms that are doing it. Uh, on those, those three topics, I think it's important, and everything I'm going to tell you, that all of the AI applications I've seen are coupled with people who are checking, is this information erroneous? Does it make sense? 
So things like judgment, expertise, and, um, and um, you know, basically experience is really important in looking what, what this is producing. So I don't know of anyone that uses AI and, and makes a big financial decision on a trading desk without having someone take a look at it. There are pieces of it that they do, but they're, they're pretty much the, the underlying. Uh, I, 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 I hearken back to, you know, when we used models for VAR, value at risk, which was this new thing to show how financial services, the level of risk they took. And uh, basically, you know, it got to the point where people thought it was great for everything. I was waiting for people to tell me when I had a headache to take VAR. Well, what happened was we had the Mexican crisis, and they found out that the model didn't really accommodate that, and firms lost tons of money. And the SEC came in and said, oh my gosh, you said you could lose $26 million on this, and you've lost a couple hundred million dollars. What happened? Well, the model wasn't checked as well as it should have been. Uh, personalized banking. Uh, people are, you know, are looking for more personalized banking. It's on your phones. You know, they take you through the steps that you need to do to do different things, whether it's transfers or whatever else, which is new. Retail banking with financial advisors. Uh, if you have money and you're investing it, Morgan Stanley just came out, I think it was only two days ago, where they're taking 16,000 of their investment advisors. And the goal is to pull all of the data in Morgan Stanley's research that can help those financial advisors advise their clients better by having better information. Now, two things that I think is important about the Morgan Stanley one, they're not using every single data fact, they're minimizing what they need and not overloading it with extraneous information that might creep into decisions or, or, or other things. So, so, and they also have people checking it, looking it over to make sure it works. Um, tar I've seen another uh, investment bank that's using uh, AI for targeted training and development, which I, I think is terrific. I'm looking to see what comes out of that pilot. And then overall, investors are spending a ton of time looking at this whole space. What should I invest in? And when I invest in it, how do I think about it? How do I think about issues that you, you mentioned that we'll get into in a few minutes in terms of ethical issues and so on and so forth? So basically, where is this going? I think that uh, at the end of the day, it's here. It's here to stay. I don't think it's going away. I'm not a believer in you know, uh, basically holding back on things, but rather experimentation I think is great. Uh, I think we have to be careful, though, particularly in financial services, it, which is a highly regulated uh, industry. There's a lot of focus on who is your client. So this notion of you know, impersonating somebody, uh, which we've seen uh, in, in many instances, but AI really amplifies the ability to do that. So I think you'll see a slower uh, migration in certain areas like know your client, the compliance issues around that. Uh, et cetera, which I think is wise. And that's before you get outside of the auspices of a particular financial institution. Um, the, the other thing I think that we're being really careful about in financial institutions is buying data from third parties. That data, you know, it may be great data, it may not. What are the biases in it, et cetera? So financial services certainly stands to um, benefit dramatically from a cost and risk perspective with AI but it'll be the approach given the regulatory regimes and, and actually the amount of money that you could win or lose in the PR risk in, in a very methodical way. And those that don't, I, I, I think you'll read about them in the paper and, and, uh, and probably regulation will go a lot quicker then. So it's here, it's here to stay. Uh, in terms of work, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting. We talk about the types of work will be where, you know, have higher level thinking in terms of, uh, you know, uh, you know, experience, judgment, uh, management experiences, et cetera. And I question myself and say, wow, if we're gonna have the machines doing all this, I know when I learned how to manage and be a leader, it was because I knew what the machine was producing and how it did it. So I wonder how we're gonna make those migrations to retain those skill sets <laughs> in financial services with respect to experience, subject matter expertise, et cetera, as more and more of the machines uh, take this over. And we've seen situation after situation where modeling, uh, you know, produces results that I, I can tell you going back, oh my God, I'm really showing my age here. Back in uh, the early 90s, um, you know, uh, Chase Manhattan Bank was making a ton of money on what was called caps, floors, and collars in the, in the derivative business. I mean, a ton of money. And at Morgan Stanley, the poor guy that ran that, that function for us, people were hitting him over the head. Why can't you make that much money? 
Well, what it turned out was the guy at Chase who was doing this is all public information, basically had a model that was in an Excel worksheet. He changed the, some cell and he was doing all these trades at, at off market prices and they wound up writing off quite a bit of money. Obviously that wasn't AI, but clearly this notion of not knowing what you're doing, not knowing what the assumptions are something that we're really spending a lot of time looking at. So anyways, I probably out, out uh, did my uh, little thing here, so let me pass it over. And that's, to, a, that's a really important point, I think, and, and we've all had the experience of using spell check, for instance. You know, we use a tool and we're more efficient because of it and it, it catches things, but sometimes spell check will replace a word with the wrong word. And so if we're not checking to see what word uh, autocorrect is doing for us, uh, and just put it out into the world, we might have written. I've gotten several student papers that had completely different meanings to their sentences because uh, of a misplaced it's word. It's funny you say that. For my birthday, I asked if the kids would write me cards in, in script, as opposed to sending me something by email or text. And I was horrified by the, the cards I got, because I thought I was related to functional illiterates. When I looked at the spelling, I was like, oh my god, did you actually not know how to spell this. It's like, well, you don't have to spell it. I guess that's true. But I would worry in, in other decision making. I'm just joking because you, you mentioned that. Anyways, I'm going to turn it to Robert, who I hope is going to get us all Yankee tickets. <laughs> so Robert, yeah, please tell us what, uh, how are you using AI in, in engineering and design and construction and where you see it's going? Yeah, um, first I want to say, although I'm not a Manhattan College graduate, um, the, the founders of our company, Charlie Thornton and Richard Tomasetti, um, both are Manhattan College grads, as well as our current chairman, executive chairman, and our current CEO. So I feel like I'm a, an adopted Manhattan College grad. Um, anyway, so um, I, I, I'd like to talk about AI from the history of how we got started experimenting with it and, and doing some art research and development. And that was, I had a software developer that worked with me um, in 2015 that, and this was not that AI or machine learning was new, but it was certainly not used in our in industry, in, in architecture and engineering construction. Um, but when he told me that it was, you know, you can feed it, you can feed a, a, a cre or create or harness or extract or mine um, intelligent data, solve solutions, train a model based on those solved solutions, and then once you have that trained model, you ask it the question within the inputs of that, those trained mo that, that data set, and it will give you the answer. And I was thinking to myself, isn't that what we do on a regular basis with an experienced engineer? They've solved all those solutions over many, many years. I ask them that question as a young engineer, they're gonna give me the answer. They don't need to solve that problem anymore. It's stored in their head. So then if you extract that to, if you, Think about what, as an engineering consultancy, that we deliver, that we, uh, the crux of our business is, is that we sell our intelligence through our deliverable. Maybe a report, or maybe blueprints and drawings, it maybe models, it maybe other things that we do in our office, which are many. Um, so what if you could capture that knowledge over many, many years into, uh, store it in a very smart, model or a series of models and have that in perpetuity. That's ridiculously powerful. Um, and, and by the way, it is biased information, which is actually what we want as a consultancy. Uh, that makes us our, our consultancy unique and, our, and what we deliver unique. And so that's when we started to sit, think about, um, okay, how can we smartly um, either extract data from our past projects, or create that data, we call it synthetic data generation, and then create those models such that there are solved solutions within that model. And that's what we've been doing for the last, since 2015. And we, we, we released a, um, uh, a product called Asterisk, which was able to predict the full design of a building, structural design, within a minute. That building would take a team of engineers three to four weeks to do. We can do it in under a minute, meant multiple iterations of that design. Was it 100% correct? Absolutely not. But it was about 85 to 90% correct. 
it wasn't something that you would, you know, give to a building department to design, but it gave you certain, um, I would say, uh, optimization ideas of what is driving the particular sort of, you know, cost of the building or the weight of the building, all of the things that you need to, to understand. So we've been um, uh, improving those models over the years, and we're kind of at a point now where we're confident that it will be an everyday use. And you know, um, obviously, we've been investing a lot of money in, in researching this, but um, uh, you know, I'm you know extremely sort of um, bullish that it will be a regular part of our of our business in the near future, um, like this year. <laughs> um, so it, in, in architecture, now again, we're, we're an engineering firm, so we're not doing, you know, um, you know we sort of create the, the, the skeleton of a building, for instance, uh, to make it stand. Um, um, and we have a significant responsibility as well. So getting to the point of, uh, of, of checking our work is even more important now with machine learning giving results because we can't have you know a, an unsafe building is our the stakes are so much higher in, in what we do it's similar in the medical profession as well you cannot have a, an artificial intelligence bot giving information that may affect someone's life um, so you know if it's if you're asking you know chat GPT about a recipe for you know blueberry pie or something you know it's not a big deal it, it, you know but when you're talking about people's lives their stakes are higher so therefore, we have to do a significantly sort of more, um, create a, a roadmap such that people don't use it, uh, or people do use it in the right way, I would say. Um, and, uh, you know, we're sort of early adopters of machine learning and AI in, in the AEC industry. Um, uh, but I think it will be a significant part of, uh, of the industry. And I will say this also, it also solves a lot of our problems as well. We have, there is lack of uh, talent in our, in our industry right now. I think it's the lowest, uh, uh, um, lowest rate of, of unemployment in many, many years. Um, so we have a shortage of talent. The cost, our cost, uh, you know, sort of comp competitive issues with cost is, is extremely high. So, you know, we, we, we are in business to make money. So if we can't make money, we won't be in business that, that long. So we need to, automate certain aspects of our business. Um, and I also think um, from the younger staff, they will not do the drudgery that I did in the 90s, uh, you know, working 60, 70 hours a week on weekends, et cetera, doing very manual things. Um, I think AI can be like a, AI for engineering could be like a video game. And if you can, you can learn significantly faster, kind of like, by the way, the Matrix. You're reminding like, me of my high school days yeah. where I took a drafting class and I, I, I rebelled and said to the teacher, why do I have to learn how to make perfect block letters with a pencil? A computer is going to do this. And he said, well, it, it you get an F. So, so that, that, that's my take on machine learning and AI in our industry. We're just at the sort of beginning. Thank you. And I'm being told that for the people at home to be able to hear us, we need to have our mics right, right up to our mouths there. Um, but um, just really out of curiosity, uh, have, has any of your engineers been happily surprised by what AI has generated? Have they, has it come up with an idea that engineers have said, I never would have thought of that? Um, right now, we are not, the type of machine learning that we're using is not, um, uh, you know, sort of necessarily, um, I would say, creating anything. It is giving, you give it certain inputs, it's giving you an output. Um, however, engineers are finding sort of insights that they wouldn't have otherwise found if these, these you know, solutions weren't being uh, sort of developed in, in almost instantaneously. So I think that's where the insights is very important in our industry, and I think that's, at a minimum, uh, a, a really nice thing to have. That's really fascinating, thank you. And Noreen, I've been reading so many articles about how the legal profession is already being impacted uh, by AI tools. And I'm wondering if you could talk about your own experiences of what you're seeing happening and what your predictions are. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everybody. Happy to be here. 
Um, I'll echo a little bit of what Eileen said uh, earlier. The earliest um, iterations of AI were already being used in the legal profession, probably over the last 10 to 15 years. And this is really in the area of discovery and litigation, where you have, you know, hundreds of millions of, hundreds of millions of pages of documents that may or may not be responsive to a lawsuit. And so using search engines to find the relevant documents, call them out, find the ones that may be privileged or um, confidential and tag them. And then somebody would still need to do what I would say, use their, their expertise, their judgment, quality control to make sure what is going out the door is actually relevant to whatever the legal matter that you're dealing with. There's also, there was also, at least in the legal profession, a fail-safe of a clawback. So if something went out the door inadvertently and you realized it, you could contact the other party and say, I need to claw this back. It needs to come back. It needs to come out of case. It's not relevant. It's privileged. It's confidential, whatever. It's, that's been going on for like a decade. This is, this, this is like an early adopter, I would say, um, on the AI side. And it's just, it's really, the purpose was to raise the efficiency and the speed and reduce the spend of one of the most expensive parts of the legal profession. And you often are dealing with court deadlines and you need to get something done in three weeks or three months or whatever the deadline is and you might not have enough bodies to do this work themselves. And so this was really a way of reworking the profession and I would say in a positive way where the efficiency went up and the quality uh, of work went up and you still had the same level of whether it would be paralegals or you know associate lawyers doing this review and still getting the work out but doing it in a more efficient way. So that, that's been going on for a very long time. I've been playing around now with the um, the newest versions of like ChatGPT and the new models that have been coming out, and they're absolutely fascinating. I have um, I've had them generate draft lawsuits on technology that I am intimately familiar with. I'm not going to say what because I don't want to give anybody any ideas, but um, I've I've said draft me you know a California class action complaint against product X, and it comes up with pretty much anything like it comes up pretty pretty accurate and all you need to do is submit the plaintiff or submit the parties or submit you know if you wanted to do the defense to that lawsuit the same thing so it it's really creating an, an interesting scaffolding that I think is very very useful but you still need that input you still need that personal component that personal you know creativity of what, you know, how, how does it, how do I personalize this? And how do I make it a, about a, you know, a real issue? You know, I can get the, I can get the scaffolding in place. I ran it on um, contracts. Can you go through this contract and flag for me provisions that you find potentially problematic? And it did, it did. So I think that there's a lot to be done and it's a lot, I think it's gonna be very, um, I think very just efficient in the legal profession, but I don't think it's gonna take away work. I think it's gonna change the way the work is done. I think it's gonna be more about whatever prompts you're putting in, the QC that goes around it, QC being quality control. Um, it's going to be about, you know, kind of the, still that personal component of what you're doing and, and, and why you're doing it and who you're doing it for. But um, I can certainly see the efficiencies being incredibly powerful. And yeah, related, related to those efficiencies and how it is changing how we are doing everything, you know, we're noticing this right now in education where um, you know, the version four, at least, of ChatGPT 
uh, you know, was able to ace the uniform bar exam. Uh, he gets a five score on the AP for biology and US history and government and multiple other subjects. And so the, the types of assignments that, that professors would give students, um, we have to sort of you know, think again about um, how students are presenting this because you know, we, we have two functions as, as teachers and the, one that, the reason why we get into this uh, profession is because we want to foster a love of lifelong learning and, and being able to, to uh, demonstrate uh, uh, real skills and, and um, transferable knowledge that they can use for the rest of their lives. But we're also charged with assessing student performance and we have to give them grades to, so that we're not a diploma mill, so we don't just say everyone gets a degree and we are saying that we're, we're pretty confident the student knows what they're talking about. And AI has uh, potential if we give the same assignments that we have been giving in some cases of being able to do those assignments uh, for students. Um, so I'm wondering, um, we'll start uh, with you, but in the legal profession and, and elsewhere, what are some of these um, ethical concerns, the, the um, legal ramifications, the risks of, of using AI? We showed an image before of Skynet and the Matrix, uh, but you know, more realistically, what are, what are some things that we should be concerned about and how should we protect uh, against AI running rampant? Well, I'll start there with, um, I'm going to put my legal hat back on. And I will say the biggest question right now, which is unresolved and untested, is whether or not this is even legal. And I'll give you an example. Let's just say you're sitting down in Higgins or you're down in Leo and you're in the civil engineering class and your teacher tells you to write, you know, a, a, a paper on, I'm, gonna use, I'm using my California hat now, uh, atmospheric river impact on uh, construction in you know northern california and you go on and you put the prompts into ai and maybe you have an environmental you know uh, or uh, financial analysis by eileen in there and you have a design by robert in there that's their copyrighted work and the ai can pull that together the engine can pull that together and give you a report. That's their work. You took it without their approval. Is it even legal to do this? This is untested, untested territory. It's not been proven through the courts. It's, not, it's just too new. And it's often the case that technology is way ahead of the law. And so we're going to see where it goes. But that's the one side of it. The other side of it, I'll just use the other side of my hypothetical. You were very clever. You put very clever questions together to create your paper. Do you own that paper? The US Copyright Office now says no, because it was generated by an engine. So that's the other side of the equation. Your output may or may not be your own output. So there's just this really interesting dynamic that's unproven and untested in the law right now. I'll, I'll leave the ethical discussions to my colleagues here, but I just wanted to raise that because that is the case where, um, where this technology is right now. And again, it's unproven, it's untested. Uh, the uh, US Copyright Office just ruled that an image generated by uh, AI like Dolly or Midjourney is not copyrightable. And so uh, I think there was a case where someone else had taken that image and used it in the company, said, that's our image. And Copyright Office says, no, that's actually was generated by an AI, and we can only copyright works generated by humans. Um, yeah, but um, there's also a, a recent article this week only uh, about a technology company that discovered that uh, AI had, um, ChatGPT actually had plagiarized its, uh, its work, and so it's, but it doesn't quite know who to sue in that respect. I, 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 I've, I've seen talk about watermarking or things like that, but I'm not sure where that's going to go. But yeah, yeah, who do you, who do you sue? So this uh, yeah. summer, the US Copyright Office is having public hearings, if anybody wants to participate in that, uh, 
asking these questions and trying to find a path forward of what to do about this. So that's really ex uh, exciting and a little terrifying too. Um, Robert, I'm wondering um, what are some of the concerns, some of the risks that that you've already seen or what you see going forward in the widespread use of this technology? Yeah, I think what I've seen is that um, a lot of what you get back from particularly these, you know, large models like ChatGPT is so believable. The, the, the English is so good that you have, there's a temptation to just use it as is. And um, in our business, that's a huge no-no. Um, the quality, con quality assurance, quality control requirements um, and just practical requirements of the fact that you don't exactly know where the source of that information is coming from could be really dangerous. And so, you know, that sounds obvious, but, you know, because it's so believable, because it so sounds so, um, you know, as if your principal told you that answer, or sometimes it's even better than what the principal says, um, you, a young engineer may use it verbatim. And so I think in our industry, in, in, in engineering, particularly at architecture as well, um, there needs to be safeguards against using any kind of AI without uh, you know, checking and supervision. Um, that is the, and I will say that is, we already have that culture to some extent. Um, for those of your engineers in the room, if you're doing a finite element modeling, which is structural simulation or, or mechanics and simulation, um, we have a terminology called garbage in, garbage out. And um, so if your inputs are not appropriate, of course your output is not gonna be appropriate. And that's the same thing with any kind of machine learning and AI uh, uh, model is that if it's somehow has bad information in there, it's gonna give bad information out. Um, so even more so, I think, at least in our industry, I think there will be a, there won't be an issue, there's always an issue, but there, there, there won't be a resistance to having people double check and triple check their work. There's always the risk of the um, technology asserting some sort of authority or are we ceding authority to a technology would be a more accurate way of, of putting that uh, as if it was wearing a lab coat and a clipboard and we said, well, the AI program told me to do that. Um, so it's, it's a, a challenge to remember that this is a valuable tool, that it's trained on data sets uh, that have been guided by humans, and humans are valuable, and so therefore the machines that we build are valuable as well. Yeah, very true. Very true. So, um, Eileen, I'm wondering uh, what you're Robin. wondering about uh, when it comes to the financial services industry. We just saw SV, um, the bank, uh, you know, basically uh, go under because of uh, using a model that uh, purchased a lot of bonds, and it turned out that was the wrong move. Uh, when interest rates were going up. I don't know if that was AI generated or not, but when we're relying more and more of these tools, um, what are some of the risks you see and, yeah, and what are some I, of the guardrails we yeah, should Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, characterize Silicon Valley Bank as a, um, as a situation with AI. I think that it's a very unique situation there where you had tons of money coming in in 2021 in deposits, and they invested it all in pretty short, in, in longer term treasuries. And uh, you, you know the story, treasury rates went up from close to zero to 5%. I think it's just bad classical treasury management. Uh, I, I, I don't, I, I mean, I used to be a treasurer. I, you know, I, I think it's just, I, I, I can't really ascribe that to AI. But anyways, what, what I worry about is invasion of privacy. There's five top worries for us. Uh, we've seen increase in cyber threats, and they're going directly at the data now, not just at the applications, et cetera. Social manipulation and data abuse, I, I think the best example of that, and I'm not gonna get into it in any detail, is, is um, Cambridge Analytica. Job displacement, I think, is a big uh, issue that we need to discuss as a society, with government and corporate, and bias discrimination. I think, the, at least for me as an individual, one of the biggest uh, areas is job disp displacement, and I looked at a lot of studies on this, and interestingly, uh, people that have done a lot more work on this than me and McKinsey and other consulting firms believe from the studies they've done that if we do this properly, that through, t t through 2030, and God knows where we go after that, that's you know, beyond my imagination, 
um, that you know, if we focus on growth, innovation, and investment, that we can pretty much you know, deal with the jobs that will be lost through, through automation and AI. And, and what they focus on is, and, and it's interesting, you know, they, they, on the other side of the coin, they think there's 75 to 375 million jobs globally that'll disappear. Now, so that means there's gonna have, if they think it's gonna be net flat, that there has to be a lot of retraining and a lot of investment in retraining and reskilling. And um, I, I think that's gonna be pretty important here. Uh, and, and the types of jobs that, that we'll need to do that reskilling for. The other interesting part of it is China accounts for about 12% of that, um, or 100, well, actually, they account for 100 million, but only 12% of the people that would be impacted. In the US and uh, Germany, it's more like a third, and in Japan, it's 50%. So these are big numbers. Now, so where's the growth gonna come from? I, I, I think that, um, that uh, Noreen just, which is you know basically an ESG, there's a lot going on in terms of solar, wind, renewable energy, the jobs that could be created there in manufacturing, construction, and installation, the chargers that we need to put in the ground throughout our whole system. I mean, if you have an electric car and you want to take a trip from New York to Florida, well, good luck finding, finding a place to you know, do, do your car. And there's companies right now doing that in scale and mass and size. I think that provides a lot of jobs <coughs> in that area is solar, uh, wave technology, so, so these are areas that are growing. Uh, and then in the investment on our, our, our antiquated infrastructure, you know, we could really make a lot of progress providing jobs there to, to upgrade the, the, the infrastructure. Uh, the types of jobs that people say will be around will be, you know, healthcare workers, care for the elderly. Um, they still see, you know, expertise in, in, um, in, in really being needed to make judgments and so on and so forth. People don't see that going away. Um, the, my understanding is there'll still be engineering jobs, there'll still be accounting jobs, they'll be different, and there'll need to be a lot of reskilling. So I'm more focused, I, I focus on that. Um, on the bias discrimination, I think it's a huge issue for us. I don't really know the answer, and, and I hope someone comes up with one, but you know, most of the data is, it, by nature, is biased, right? I remember, I don't know if you folks remember Amazon, I think it was Amazon, uh, did, um, had some uh, automated recruiting. And they were shocked that it only picked white males. Well, you know what, the 10 years they looked at, in terms of the data, the computer was right. It basically said it should be white males, and, and so they had to redo it for women. Um, you know, or the study that the healthcare system did where they looked at, I think it was 200 million people, and. You know, they didn't really look at the distinction between uh, health care needs for white and blacks. On the, they, they basically based it on cost, which is not, it, there's a big difference in how people pay for it. I'm just mentioning these small things. They sound like small things, but think of the impact of the mistakes of these and, 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 and needing people in it. So, so I think uh, on the bias discrimination piece, I think we're going to still see that. I think we need to manage its advancement and manage it well. I don't think it's going to go away as we, we do these pilots because there's just, too much data out there, but maybe someone will come up with some nifty way to, to, to undo that. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Cyber threats is huge for us. Um, and um, you know, invasion of data privacy is probably my number one where we really need to focus on who are our clients, who are the businesses we're dealing with. <laughs> and there's been a lot of, a lot of th interestingly, when I, and Maureen, you might know more than me, I really see the tech companies coming up on fines in terms of data privacy, and, and more recently too, uh, versus other industries. It seems to be a bit concentrated in there, which leads me to my last point, uh, where I, I do think we need to continue to work, have work, regulators work with technology companies, work with industry to come up with regulations that safeguard people's data privacy. And I know there are companies out there, I just was talking to someone yesterday, that have a patent on, you know, utilizing technology to um, instantiate knowing who the person is, who the business is, and is it perfect? No, but it takes it to a whole new level in terms of security. So those are the things that I kind of worry about, um, and 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 I'll leave it on this last note. I don't think that any any one body has all the answers. There's things in healthcare. There's things in um, in um, in every industry, financial services, so on and so forth. 
And so I think we need to work collectively from the first investor in a technology to the last end user to make sure that we're looking at that uh, in a manner that makes sense to protect people's rights, to protect my copyright, Noreen's copyrights. I don't know what the answers are, but I'm sure you'll figure it out, Noreen. Uh, not my job. I'll go, I'll go figure out the numbers on it. But um, this is huge. This is like a step function. This is like, this is like to me, you know, co comparable to the 1900s when people migrated from agriculture uh, in the United States and Europe and later in China. I mean, this is a huge change. And, uh, and, and I think if we don't work together for the different um, bodies that we have established, that we're gonna get into this position where do job displacement is a really big issue. And, and at least on an individual level, we all know how hopeless people feel when they lose their job and they never lose that sense of hopelessness, evidently, psychologically. So it's great for the economy to, to, to make sure we don't get in that position. It's great for government. It's great for our politicians. It's great for us. But how do we get the dialogue where we're not fighting you know, two sides of the aisle, but rather the, de the debate is about improvement, the debate is about progress, the debate isn't about who won the debate? Yeah, there's no that. way to stop this completely, but there's also no reason to let it run rampant as, e as well. And a lot of these solutions, I suspect, are not going to be technological in nature, but will I involve uh, political solutions, regulatory solutions, uh, in even social solutions. It's funny when we uh, talk with our students in class, uh, just the amount of information that is scooped up, the amount of data that is scooped up just from using your phones. Uh, and it's not just the what you would expect, like demographic information and the, your search history and things like that. But we have, you know, we had TikTok on on Capitol Hill just now, uh, talking about this. Um, they're reading your emotional states, really, right? When you do a filter with a happy face or a, or a, a frowny face or something, that's that's an emotional state that is captured as a data point and can be used. So one of my students, you know, will talk about cases where they've said something and their phone responded in a in a search or presented a web page that was exactly what they were talking about. They say, "Oh my God." Are, are are phones listening to us? And our response is usually, well, no, it's it's actually much worse. The the phones aren't listening to you. It's just that they've modeled you so well, they predicted what you were talking about. Um, so with that, uh, with these incredible changes uh, coming our way, I'm wondering, we'll just open this up to anybody who'd like to, to talk about this. Uh, what do we need to know uh, living in this future with with AI, um, how do we first of all how do we educate students about this, and and what do students need to prepare for when they're going to be entering into a world where this exists in in their workplaces, in their in their leisure activities, uh, ev everywhere basically. Uh, I'll take I'll take a pass at that. I, I think I think the first thing to do is know what know what limitations. Um, and the fact that it can give you wrong information. But having said that, I think, uh, you know, I would leverage as much as you can for the benefit of whatever you're trying to learn. Um, I will say I think there is a benefit potentially that AI machine learning could allow people to learn faster, um, um, you know, without, uh, you know, experiencing the same types of experiences that, uh, you know, many of us have had to do over the many years of, of being an engineer or a lawyer or whatever. So I think there's, there's a benefit there that you'll learn faster and get to the point of being very productive much, much sooner. I think the other, I would say, recommendation I would have is to, it will be an environment in which we will need to stay ahead of the robots in a way, to constantly um, improve, learn new things such that we don't are not stagnant. I, we in our business, I we use the the sort of analogy of, you know, 30 years ago, if you were the, you know, the best beam designer, you know, in the in the office, um, and then Excel came around, and then we can design, you know, a thousand beams in two minutes. That's probably not the best. You know, you have to you have to future proof yourself in many ways. And so um, that's, it's going to be very similar to what we are, where we are now. Um, and so what machine learning is not great at is 
is cognitive thinking and, and you know, significant creativity. And I think that's where an engineer's path should be. You know, the machine learning will do the drudgery, the simple things, at least in the near future. And then, you know, the engineering um, designer, if you will, can uh, create, you know, new designs that have never been created before. Um, and I think that's where, that's why I mean about the learning and the training and, and all of those things. All right, what was the question? Got it. Okay, so um, I'll start by saying I'm Gen X, and I have three daughters, Gen Y and Gen Z. Gen Z is graduating from Manhattan College um, on May 17th. I'm very excited about that. Um, and I will say that the evolution of their trajectory, and I think it equates to a lot of the students here, is that they grew up kind of in the iPhone era. They started with, it was iTunes in the beginning, it was the iPod, 2005, then iPhone in 2007, and they're very, the current generation is very comfortable with putting a lot of information about themselves online and putting it out there, whether it's on Instagram, whether it's what they ate, if it's Facebook, whether it's, you know, pick your app, but they're very comfortable with that. And so you just need to know that what you're putting out there is going to be harvested. It, it, it is what it is. If, if, you know, there's this, it's, the, it's the, the digital golden age of information collection. And um, companies are going to, for the most part, use it. If your service is free, you are the product. Just remember that. You're getting online and you're using a free service, you are the product. And so just understand that. Be, be responsible, be thoughtful, be impactful. Recognize that if you're gonna be hire, you know, applying for a job, your digital information is gonna be looked at by the prospective employer and just just be thoughtful about what you're doing and what you're putting out there about yourself. And it's in your control. It still is in your control. And that would be my advice for this current age with you know, all of this data gathering and data collection and you know, marketing things for you. I mean, I, it, it happens to me. I get like, I, I'm, I'm not even gonna tell you some of the stupid stuff I get advertised to me, but it's pretty funny. Um, anyway. But it, 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 it's, it, it's out there, and it's in your control. And you can, you can turn it off. You can be impactful and thoughtful about what you put online about yourself. Well, I don't really have much to add. Those were two excellent answers. I guess I'm the whatever, though, huh? <laughs> so from whatever, um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, at least when I graduated, technology was going to eliminate all these things. I, I'm, I'm a believer that that's not gonna be the case and we'll figure out a way. I do think it's really important though to, to be a critical thinker and to be a learner. And what I mean by critical thinking is, uh, you know, I'm gonna date myself, but I used to be involved with uh, derivative products and for a year I had a bunch of people working for me and I started hearing answers like, well the computer said, or, which it didn't talk back then, or the report said, and I was like, Jesus, these people do not know why they're doing what they're doing. And, and I'm not just talking about trade processing, I'm talking about trading, et cetera. And so it's really important to understand, even though the computer do, can do it all for you, and you have a great assistant in chat PBT, I think it's a great assistant, you know, it can, oh my God, I mean, it just gives you a great recipe for a lot of things beyond blueberry pie. And, and, but I think that you have to question it. Where is it coming from? What are the assumptions? And I think that being a critical thinker will distinguish you. And I think being a constant learner. I mean, I, I, I'm still learning about these technologies. It's not, my, it's not my business, but it's wonderful. And I think by being a constant learner, you'll be more creative, you'll have more impact, and you'll add a lot of value. And, and I completely agree with uh, Noreen. I've seen too many people who have put things out there on the, 
on the internet that wish they hadn't. And you know, it's really tough to, to, to take back. So I couldn't agree with that more. I agree with you. Robert, in terms of it's about creativity, and it'll be an upstep function, but please remember that you need to know, uh, you know, we, we have people, you know, basically planes almost fly themselves today, but if the plane computer goes out, the pilot knows how to do it. Uh, if you look at the uh, helicopters they're doing with Archer, there'll be someone that knows how to fly it. So I'm not saying you have to know every step, and drudgery can certainly go away, but you really need to be a questioner. You need to be a, a critic of this information. Trust but verify. Trust but verify. And good luck to everybody. I, I, I have one more thing to, 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 to add to that, is that um, actually, I'm actually signed up to, it's, it's a LinkedIn thing, it's called AR for Good. And um, I think there's many, many aspects of our society today that can be solved um, using AI machine learning. And for the entrepreneurs out there, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, um, Microsoft would not be in business today if it wasn't for AI machine learning. They leverage um, uh, this technology every day um, of, of every minute and every second uh, to, to sort of make, develop their business. So there are huge business opportunities out there for um, leveraging various aspects of the technology, um, you know, for the better good of, uh, of you know, of, of the country, essentially. So thank you so much. We have uh, some uh, time for questions in just a, a moment here. Um, we had over 60 questions submitted. Uh, for this event, so we're not going to get to every one of them, uh, but we also have many people in the room who want to ask a question. But before we turn to those questions, I just want to recognize that uh, we have several uh, really fantastic advisory board members of each of our schools at Manhattan College. And um, it's New York City, uh, which means that there's traffic, so I'm not sure how many people made it, but I, th I think we have a few people here. And so what I like to do right now is invite our Board of Advisors to come up to this microphone and introduce themselves and, and if they have anything that they like to talk about and how AI is being used uh, in their industry, in their profession, what they're seeing. I haven't seen AI used in uh, engineering. I have a lot of concerns with it. Right, um, by the way, my name is Milo Reverso, class of 81. Um, got a master's and a doctorate after I graduated Manhattan College and been very active here. But I haven't seen AI used in, in my industry. Um, and I have a lot of concerns about it. Uh, and they stretch everything from, you know, the state education department and our professional licensing, demanding that an engineer show the calculations that he performed, no one else, and before he puts a sign and seal on it, not just checking someone else's calculations. Um, I, I have concerns for, you know, AI learning from everything we do, and I've seen structural failures and mechanical and electrical failures in almost every single project that I've been involved with. So if AI is learning from those data sets, then I have a concern for what they might tell uh, our, our engineers to do in the future. But the one question I'd like to hear all of your opinion on is if you were a, a professor at Manhattan College, Eileen, you were teaching a finance too. Uh, Robert, you were teaching a reinforced concrete too. And Eileen, you were teaching contracts or, or, or something else. How would you change your education of your student and how you present the material to incorporate AI, GPT? Uh, and I'm not talking about you know, how to keep your students honest from generating solutions from them. I'm talking about how do you, what would you do different in educating your students to prepare them for the work environment they're going out in, uh, and uh, into, and would you modify it? Because all three of you said you have to verify and check, which means they have to know what they've been taught for the last four, you know, that we're currently teaching them. But how would you, uh, because they, otherwise they can't verify it. So how would you modify how you uh, teach a student and present the material in a course for each one of those courses? I'd love to hear your opinion. Um, 
wow, I, I never thought of myself as the agent in Manhattan College. Thank you for that promotion. Um, I, I guess, and I don't know if the, a lot of people are not going to like this answer, I think it's really important for people to understand how things work. So if I were teaching a finance course, an accounting course, I would have people, you know, basically they could do it on Excel, but I'd want to know that they know how to do debits and credits. I'd want to know that they know how to do a general ledger. I'd want to know that they know that, you know, even if they use blockchain, the distributed ledger, it ultimately has to balance. And then maybe in the second part of the course, I'd say, hey, and you could have this assistant who can help you with a lot of things. It's called AI, and here's the way that, the, and I'm not talking about if someone cheats either, but I'm just saying, I'd want people to know how to do first and then use AI versus, because for, I'm just speaking for me, maybe I'm not smart enough, I wouldn't be able to check something uh, if, if I didn't know how to do it. Or I would get someone else in, you know, as you get on in life, you can't know everything. You get other experts in that, that know what they're doing. So just like I, if I went to a doctor, I wouldn't want an AI, you know, basically diagnosing me but I would use chat BBT to say, hey, these are my symptoms. What are the different things? But I still want a doctor. Yeah, I, I, I've taught reinforced concrete, so I can, I, I'll, say, I'll say that um, I, I don't think I would change anything, actually, because I think engineers need to know the basics, uh, the basic principles of physics and engineering um, to understand the background of, uh, of a solution, for instance. Um, and I think education is more about learning how to learn um, than necessarily learning how to design, you know, a reinforced concrete beam, which, um, by the way, most computer software does automatically these days. So 25 years ago, 20, whatever, 28 years ago when I started, it didn't do that. We had to do it by hand. But the programs that you do today actually run through the whole thing. So um, what we still, it's really important to know what's behind the curtain of those software. So I don't, from an educational standpoint, particularly undergraduate, I don't think I would change anything. Great question, Milo. Um, I would say from a legal perspective, uh, I would still stay with the Socratic method, and I would still, even if your student or my student generated, um, let's just say a basic software license agreement or a basic non-disclosure agreement, I would want that student to be able to stand up in my class and defend each clause in that contract. Why is it there and what is its purpose? Or, in the alternative, advocate the other side. Say you're saying the other side, so you're the opposing party. Why do we want to strike this clause? Why do we want to amend this clause? So AI can generate the contract, but not, not the thought process behind it. And so the student still needs to be able to do that type of analysis and if they're going to be an effective lawyer and, you know, an advocate for the rest of their life. So that's what I would do. Let, let, let AI generate the contract, but you've got to defend it or argue against it. Uh, William Taylor. Chemical Engineering Board of Advisors. Um, I originally had this question for Robert, but as I'm going through it, it really falls under each one of you. So I'm hoping you guys can give a little bit of feedback in each of your areas. For us as your recipients of all the AI, but also students going out into that world, how do you fight the complacency that develops in those critical review cycles? Because you each now have mentioned the review cycle is the critical piece. So how do you fight that complacency, keeping that balance of time savings that AI affords us with the quality control. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I would say um, you can give more work, <laughs> more problems to solve. Um, uh, again, in, in, I would say in the, in the world of education, I still don't think I would change anything necessarily. I, I think that um, we need uh, um, we need to be critical thinkers, um, and uh, I think it will be very important very very soon to spot when AI is giving a solution that may be wrong, um, as much as you know um, uh, you know just getting the right answer. 
in many in, in many circumstances in engineering as well it's it's it, to spot errors is as important as getting finding a solution. Um, so that would be my response. I guess I would take I would take issue with your characterization of complacency. I think we um, we're in a different world. I mean, I grew up in the world where, you know. I had a hustle and a side hustle and a second high side hustle. I mean, I worked two waitressing jobs, you know, paid my way through college, all that sort of thing. And I think that the students and the young people today have a little bit more balance and perspective in their lives. And they work and they do what they need to do. And then they take time for their, themselves. And I think AI is helpful in making their work efficient, but still intellectually challenging. And I think at the same time that then they have time to go hiking or biking or playing with their dogs or whatever it is that makes them happy. And I'm happy for that. I, I love it for my own kids. I really do. And um, it's just a different world. I mean, we just came out of a three-year pandemic where everybody was just locked down in their houses. And so I, I totally understand the balance. And I think complacency isn't the right characterization for it. Um, I think that's an excellent question from a business perspective. Um, I'm not an educator, so I, you know, I, I, I think I've already answered. You know, I, would, I would make sure people knew what they were doing. I would introduce them to these new assistants, though, to the extent it could be helpful. From a business perspective, how do you deal with the fact that you're an employee, and it's going to take you X amount of time to get why done using AI versus you doing it yourself. I think that's a real dilemma. And while I could say that I think it's an obligation of management and leadership to make sure people are appropriately trained, sometimes that doesn't happen, at least in my career. And so, you know, I had to look forward and say, okay, I'm making a, a choice today. Do I want to go hang out with these people or do I want to really understand why I'm doing what I'm doing? And so I think those are choices that people have. And so for me, the choice was, I mean, I'm the last person to talk about work-life balance. I always send someone to someone else. It's not my gift. But I think, you know, taking the time early on to really understand why you're doing what you're doing. I'll tell you, my own career, like, I didn't make VP till much later than other people. But then I went pretty quickly. And I think it was because I spent a lot of time in different functions and just out of in curiosity, like, why are we doing this? Like, why does this work this way? And I think that critical thinking in, slowed me down in my progress initially, but accelerated it going forward. Um, and I'm just speaking, I'm, that's not statistically valid, but I will tell you that entrepreneurs that I deal with now that I advise, people that I know that are highly successful, they weren't the first people out the door, even the younger people today. So I'm dealing with, I, I advise five different companies, and I can tell you all the people are less than half my age. Um, God, that's a little depressing, but that's okay. What, look at the option. So, so I'm not really sure completely with the answer other than it's choices and it's up to you. And I think it's great if you can figure out a way to have balance as well and I'd be happy for people with that too, but it, it's not a formula that worked for me and a lot of people I see that are in different fields, I don't, I don't see it working for them, but, but maybe it's, it's going to and there's some formula. So we have about 15 minutes left, and I'd like to open this up to questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Fantastic. Please come on up. Thank you. Hello. My name is Barbara Ferraro, and I'm a consultant with the School of Education, and I'm a retired school superintendent. So I come to you with a K-12 perspective right now. I don't have many questions or even an, a question for you. I want to start with a comment. I, it really was kind of warmed my heart to hear all of you on the panel speak about the fact that critical thinking is really important as we move forward, that AI is important, it certainly is, and I listened to you and I've kind of thought about what that means for our children and our educators in the field. AI is a partner, but it will not replace the human element. So I'm thinking, are schools going to be moved, are, are K-12 schools going to move in a direction when we're going to rely more on AI than the teacher in a classroom? Of course, my hope is not, and I hope that we can 
see that as, see the partnership that would enrich the classroom. But if I do have a question for you, <clears throat> this is it. As people from various fields, not the field of education, but you've all talked about education, is there any advice that you would give the K-12 educators and the community school boards as they're moving forward? Because my view, and I always say the pandemic changed everything, and it changed a lot for K-12 schools. And people are thinking that we can replace that K-12 environment with more remote kind of learning. And of course, as a, an educator who's now retired, I've spent 50 years doing this, <clears throat> I would not like to see that happen. And I heard all of you say that it is important to in, inspire the young people, whether they're people in your fields, whether we as educators, to, um, <clears throat> to think critically, to understand that the AI provides that partnership. So if you could speak a little bit about what you would like us to do as K-12 educators, I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Barbara. Um, and I say this is not an educator, but having spent time with a bunch of kids during the pandemic trying to help them get through their schoolwork, and I, I think it's really important, the socialization that school provides. I really think that, and again, this is not statistically valid, this is just my own personal experience. So. I think a comp like I do think that to the extent AI can show, hey, this student is stuck here or stuck there, it could be a, a partner to the teacher and maybe help out, particularly teachers that have 50 students in the classroom. God bless you. I don't know how you do it. But I think you're right about the socializations that, that children get in school. I'm not saying that you can't have some remote. Maybe it's a balance. I don't know what the right answer is. But that socialization, and, it, and if you think about the skill sets that are required emotional intelligence, the things that make us human. It's, it's not you know, getting the, the top math score, it's those social skills that will still be, in some ways, elevated and have been elevated and will continue to be elevated. So I, I, I think you're right. Uh, that said, you could probably argue back and forth. I, it's just an opinion, I'm, I'm not in your field. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say AI, at least for the short term, should be used just as a tool. Um, you know, it could be used as a training tool, um, but in terms of uh, you know the sort of a broad definition of education and learning, um, I think I agree that it, the the social aspect of learning is more about learning how to interact and learn from other people and collaborate with other people, and AI, for the most part, is not going to do that. And and I will say AI, in many cases, is very limited. So, you know, Tesla has spent billions of dollars on how to drive a car. And it's probably as good as a 10-year-old, maybe, something like that. So, you know, someone who's 16 years old anywhere across the country or the world is probably a better, you know, is, is, is a better driver than a Tesla car. So there's limitations to what AI can actually do. I'll cede my time because I agree with both of you. I think the social interaction that you get from being in person, learning is, is just um, irreplaceable. Yeah, um, everything that we do beyond the curriculum is a meta education. And so the way that students interact with each other and with the instructor in, in the classroom is also learning and working together in groups is also learning. And learning when to talk and when to listen is also learning. And so being able to preserve that, even with these new tools, are I think are incredibly important. I feel that Mahan College is really uh, fortunate in the sense that because we're a small uh, college and our class sizes are, are never more than 30 students and oftentimes smaller than that, that we have that interpersonal interaction. I really fear for the larger schools where you might have a lecture of 200 students or even more. Uh, I, I'm really concerned about the impact of these tools on, on courses like that. 
Uh, with about the 10 minutes we have left, I'd like to invite anyone up here who has a question to come up, and I particularly would like to encourage students, any students from Manhattan College, if you have a question from any of our panelists, please feel free to come up and use this microphone so people at home can hear, and just come on up to the microphone, and then if you can identify yourself and ask your question, um, I'm sure the panelists would love to, to engage you in conversation. So, hi, my name is Sean Lee. I'm a finance student here in the Mali School of Business. And um, before I delve into my question, I'm just going to break some things down a little bit. Um, currently, right now, AI is very rudimentary. And as you say, it is pretty much just a tool that you're supposed to use um, where you need to relatively proceed it a lot. But at some point, at the rate which technology is improving, it's going to be more highly dependent on, um, which means that human jobs themselves will ultimately change in um, reaction to the changes in technology, where likely chances are we'll be more dependent to use our innately human abilities in the workplace, such as communication skills, analytical skills, teamwork, and other things like that. But my question ultimately is, you know, human abilities, these things are relatively intangible. You know, these soft skills are kind of intangible, very hard to measure. So as qualifications for the jobs that you do start to become intangible, and the work that people has to do start to become more intangible, how do you pay people for something? How do you pay people to do a job that's changed and become in such a obscurely measurable way? Because you know it's easy to pay someone for the amount of hours that they put into a research paper. It's easy to pay someone for the number of units that they output after however much work they've done. It's hard to pay someone for being a good thinker, for being good at analysis, for being um, sufficiently extroverted and knowing how to talk to other people. It's hard to even measure what that actually means. So like, how do you pay, well, how do you pay people in the future, quite literally? Um, that's a really great question, Sean, thank you. Um, I I'll just give you my own experience. Um, I was uh, quite young when I became controller at Morgan Stanley and when they asked me to do the job, I said, oh, it must be because of my technical skills in the fixed income division, but my gosh, I don't know equities, I don't know this in detail. They said, no, that's not why we picked you. I was like, well, why'd you pick me? They said, we picked you because you're a good manager. We picked you because you're a good leader, and we're measuring that by how many people you are developing and bringing along and that are going into other departments. We're measuring that by the way the regulators want to deal with you in terms of how you treat them with dignity and respect. So these, these things that seem immeasurable, I think that most people, you know, as you become more senior, the soft skills are, are, are really what differentiate people. You know, things like leadership, what does that really mean? Things like being a good manager, what does that really mean? Teamwork, what does that really mean? But you know it when you see it, and you can measure it. You know, like I, I, I w the, the person I thought should have gotten the role you know, had an attrition rate of 25%, which I didn't realize people were measuring that. And, and, and I'm, by the way, I'm not patting myself on the back. I had no clue as to why they were doing what they were doing. Um, but but that, was, that was a really aha moment for me. And the big mistake I made was when I did become controller, I wish I had knew, known more Noreen to get work-life balance. I was working like 80 hours a week. I mean, I, 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 you know, it was ridiculous. I was trying to learn everything I didn't know. And I went home one night and they said, you know, we were going to call the police because, you're, you know, we thought a stranger came in the house. So I thought, oh my God, I better do something. These wise guys are giving me a message. And then I started asking people for help on the, on the more technical pieces. You know, the pieces that were more analytical even. And, and what I realized is most people wanted to help. And so I wouldn't diminish those, those soft skills that may seem hard to manage. And sometimes you won't get credit for it. Sometimes someone doesn't recognize it. But they re I, I, it's just been my experience that it really is what makes a big distinction in people who become senior and, and, and get paid better versus people who may not. And some people don't want to be managers or, or leaders. You know, They're happy doing what they're doing. So anyways, that would be my answer. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, that, I would say that's, that is the case today. I think the people that excel in, in, in the office are the people that are very good at working with others, training others, inspiring other people in the office, um, treating people well. Um, and I think it only will get even more important, I think, as you know, some of the, uh, you know, I would 
I'm going to call it the simple. Uh, the simple work is be, is automated, um, and and you know to the, you know to the points that we were making before about learning and training. Um, those who train people more, who sort of accelerate people's careers, um, will also be, I think, um, a large part of um, you know the success of of a, of a, of a employee at a firm, which has nothing to do with machine learning and AI. My advice to you and to the other students here who are going out into the work world is um, be available, be accessible, volunteer, raise your hand, be a good teammate, and those are the things in the beginning of your career that will get you noticed. And as you do that, you will move up in the ranks and you will be recognized for that as Eileen and Robert have talked about here already today. But as you start your career, just be, be a good coworker. Volunteer for stuff. All of the people, all of the opportunities that I have had in my career, 35 years, just simply were, you know, I, I volunteered for one other thing. Now I'm violating my own work-life balance <laughs> advice, but still, it was, hey, is there something else I can do? Can I get on that team? Can I help on that project? That goes a long way, and just be a good coworker to your peers. That goes a long way as well. People, people recognize a jerk immediately, but if you're an okay, you know, coworker, you're gonna, you're gonna do just fine. Hello, everyone. My name's William Reed. I'm a sophomore civil engineering major at Manhattan College. Um, first of all, thank you all for your time for explaining the various pros, cons, and applications of AI technology, various forms of AI technology as well, especially in the case of engineering, since I'm currently trying to apply for a bunch of different summer internships. Um, on the point of AI being used more as a tool rather than something that will probably replace a few engineers, in the case of basically giving an input value and still having engineers to check over the work, that same technology can be applied for other engineering programs such as AutoCAD or even Excel. So with that in mind, do you expect or how do you expect or how would you want to encourage or regulate the use of AI programs like this in a high school education setting or a college education setting since some classes are dedicated to teaching courses or programs like Excel but not AutoCAD? Yeah, I mean, I, I will say that you, at least even in my day, we, you know, there are, there are tests that we took that we weren't allowed to use our calculator. And, and, and so, there's going to be nothing different. I think you know you can't you know sit there at your laptop and do your, and do an answer because you may be like you know, you know calling it to some chat GPT or some other machine learning uh, uh, you know sort of system. So uh, you know again I don't think that uh, particularly in an education uh, setting that machine learning should be um, you know uh, it, it it could be part like as a tool to get you a head start. That's the way that we plan to use it, not for construction documents or for billing department submittals. It's to get a head start, and um, but with the for the engineer to then check what they've what what that what what has been told, which is nothing different than if of someone with 30 years experience tells you an answer, you still have to check that answer. Um, you know, if you're going to submit that for for a building design, so um, it, again, I see it just as a tool as a head start. Um, but in terms of learning the, the craft of engineering, you still need to know the fundamentals, where it is embedded in the code, what the physics are about it, and all of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the aspects of engineering that is required that is sort of behind the curtain of machine learning and AI. Hi, everybody. My name is Peter. I graduated in 2021 as an undergraduate, and I'm currently in my MBA. As generations pass, I think we want to leave behind a better layout of where we are than prior. Now, I think innovation strives off of something that only humans can really perpetuate, which is creativity. Do you think that AI is going to enhance creativity amongst our generation and future generations, or do you think that it may become a replacement of creativity 
in a lot and you know the mass of people in society yeah that's a good question I'm gonna say I don't know <laughs> I don't know the answer to that the um, I've read about um, authors for instance um, uh, having their own books um, fed into an uh, it's an AI model, and it helps them sort of get over writer's block, because the data, the, the the books that they've written is now the data set for their next book, which is really interesting to me. Um, I would say that's a probably more um, safe use of AI than to use you know a million other people's information, um, you know, which is could potentially be plagiarism, right? Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that. I'll be honest, this is, this, this is a new world that we're in. Um. Uh, I certainly don't know the answer, but part of it will be up to you as the next generation that's coming up and how, how do you want to leave the world behind you? Um, I hope it's used as a tool and not as a replacement. I've heard people talk about AI becoming sentient, et cetera. Uh, maybe it will, maybe it won't, but how you use it and how we incorporated into society. As Noreen said, you know, uh, technological advancements go a lot quicker than uh, legal structures, a lot, lot quicker than, um, you know, um, basically uh, regulation. I mean, look at crypto. It's been around now for how long? And we're still arguing over what regulatory body has domain over it. We're still talking about, is it blockchain or is it crypto? I mean, th th there's some people that don't even know that. But, you know, y you have the future ahead of you. And so you'll see what we leave behind, and then you'll, you'll be in a position to form how that moves forward. Um, and so, yeah, I think it should be a tool, different things you can use it for. Don't worry, I'm gonna give it to you in one second. Uh, but, but really, don't, don't lose the fact that you have a lot to shape in terms of how this all works out. And one person does make a difference. We've gone a little over on time, but I think we can squeeze in one last question here. Thanks. I, my name is Rafael. I'm a mechanical engineering student. I just wanted to ask from the engineering perspective to Robert, if you know, you give me a task and you hit me up for a selection and I get back to you and you know, I put in my inputs and I, we got the height of the building, we know the pressure and I give you a, uh, you know, like a, what would it be, like a pump selection. Would you accept that even though I used, let's say like a software like ChatGPT and like for an illegal perspective, should that be something that you know you would want your client or the person that you get the task to to state? Is that something? I guess I would like to hear the answer to that. Um, Thanks. Yeah, prob probably not. I I, um, I think the any engineering solution um, there's even interpretation into what the inputs need to be. Um, so the problem with I would say some AI um, some AI that is out there is that it is missing certain inputs or the training of those models are missing certain inputs. So for instance, um, you know, Zillow had a pretty catastrophic, uh, you know, failure in their real estate business because they were missing some nuanced inputs that was not in their trained models. So I would say if you're an engineer using AI, understand what is embedded in that, in the data set um, and then check it, of course, as I mentioned. We'll squeeze you in. Come on in. Thank you. Yeah, um, I just had a follow-up question. So previously you mentioned how as you entered into more senior roles and more management roles, uh, soft skills became um, more important to you. Um, but a question to that is that I actually kind of see a threat that AI might pose on seniority and management. Um, so this is just a theoretical example I would like to provide. So like right now, this is my iPhone. I use this every day every day. I use it for just about everything. Entertainment, um, networking. Uh, you could even say in some ways it manages my own life. It has a role of management in my own life. And I see this entering into the corporate role at some point because as, as uh, generations continue, they'll become more technolo technologically advanced, more technologically trusting, and also more technologically dependent. So therefore, there might be a situation where in future um, 
working conditions instead of relying on senior executives, senior associates, you know, management, their bosses, they'll just be, oh, you know, why don't I just ask ChatGPT, why don't I just ask artificial intelligence for my solutions? I mean, they might even provide something better than my boss or my management, you know, something along those lines. And um, as of right now, since technology is still so rudimentary, it's likely that the AI might not give the perfect solution, which might ultimately hurt results uh, within the company, might hurt profits as well. So um, how should companies and corporations and management mitigate the level of technological dependence and trust that this generation has so that it does not hurt um, the work environment in terms of seniority and management? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a, uh, a chance at trying to answer that question myself. And I've you know, already seen a generational shift in work structures where we used to have a much more hierarchical structure of uh, corporate governance. And it seems now that, uh, especially with newer companies, with startups especially, we see a more of a team approach. Uh, groups of people working together and not having, let's say, an assistant and an assistant to an assistant and an assistant to an assistant, but uh, people working together in teams. So we're already seeing sort of a breakdown in that structure. I think ultimately, though, someone has to be ultimately responsible for the product or service that you're producing. And that responsibility usually requires uh, experience of, of recognizing what is acceptable, what what is not, and to turn or to cede that authority over to an algorithm, uh, I think uh, is, is dangerous. But I'll be curious to see what everyone else's perspective is on this. Yeah, I will say um, what we've been experimenting with um, is using our own um, uh, data set, effectively, our internal intranet based uh, data, um, questions and answers, conversations um, using the uh, ChatGPT language model. So it's basically querying our data set and giving an answer, um, not the ChatGPT data set, but our data set, which is significantly smarter. There's not, there's, there's, our data set is a thousand, a million times smarter than any ChatGPT data set because it's, it comes from, you know, 80 years of experience in engineering. So, and we've actually tested it in AB of our answer versus ChatGPT answer when it comes to engineering. And uh, it's, it's not even close. So I think that's one way to mitigate, um, you know, the use of, a, 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 you know, conversational AI is to use a data set that is a known quant quantity. Yeah, I, 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 I don't, most of the companies I work with, that, that would be true. Most companies have gotten away from traditionally hierarchical, and it's a, it's a lot flatter, quite candidly, in part because of cost. But the notion of you know, basically asking the computer to tell me who's the best person for a job, there's a lot of things that aren't in those data sets. And there's a lot of things. You know, we, I spent about um, 10 years up at Bridgewater where I worked for someone who was trying to see if we could figure out who would be the best people for certain jobs. And there's certain tests you can take to see certain attributes. But there's not really a great test for creativity. There's not a great test for innovation. You know, teamwork, I don't know if there's a great test for it. I haven't found one. So when, when we went through the 100 attributes we, we wanted to go through, probably, I think it was, actually I know the number, it was 59 of them. There were no tests for and it was really judgment and how do you create experiences and so on. I can't see that changing dramatically quickly, um, but never say never. This is just the first in a series of conversations that we will be having about the impact of artificial intelligence. And so please look forward to our next session. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists for their really insightful information. <laughs> to our board of advisors who uh, asked some really insightful questions. Um, to our audiences at home watching on YouTube on Manhattan College's channel, as well as BronxNet on Optimum and Fios. And most importantly, our students for those amazing questions. Thank you.
So that'll do it for this evening, but I hope this sparks continuing conversation. I'd like to personally thank uh, all of my colleagues and my students who have been talking with me about the impact of this technology. It's really informed my thinking on this. So we're gonna continue these conversations and everyone have a great evening.